Good morning. I uh, hope that you're having a fine Irish morning this morning. I see uh, a lot of green out here in the, in the church today, more so than what we normally see. And, you know, evidently I didn't get the message. So if you would, just bow your head with, with me and we'll, uh, we'll open here in a word of prayer and then we will get to Acts chapter 17 and we're going to start right around verse 13 when we get started. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we thank you for your grace, Lord. We just thank you for all that you have provided to us. Lord, we thank you for the blessings that you've given to us and for the forgiveness that you have for each and every one of us. And Lord, if there are things in our hearts that separate us from you, Lord, we ask that you would help to identify them in our lives. Help us to be willing to let those things go. And Lord, we just ask that you would help us to ask for the forgiveness of those things and just to clear those things from us. And Lord, we just pray that you would allow us to be a blessing to others and that you would allow us the grace that we may understand that grace and be able to pass it on to others as well. Lord, we thank you for this place that you've given us to gather. And Lord, we just thank you for the word that you have for us and for our hearts. In your name we pray, amen. Well, I hope that you've had a good week. Uh, it's, it's been an interesting week. And, uh, you know, the temperature here in Kansas kind of plays tricks with this. It kind of goes high and low and high and low. So right now, today, I think we're kind of in a little bit of a low. But, you know, it is springtime in Kansas. So here in chapter 17 of the book of Acts, just to continue with where we we're going, you know, Paul has been, been preaching, and he's been going his second time around, and he was in Thessalonica, and they kind of ran him out. And here in verse number 13, it says, But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. And then immediately the brethren sent Paul to go as it were, to the sea, but Silas and Timotheus abode there still. So the people of Berea, from just to kind of recap from last week a little bit, they were very scholarly in the nature of the Bible and of the text, and they were constantly searching through Scripture. So what, whenever Paul came and whenever he was giving them the word, they were actually taking a look at that word, and they were comparing it to Scripture. And they were more open to the understanding of the Word of God and to Christ as the Savior <coughs> than a lot of other peoples. And uh, the Thessalonians, where he was at prior to that, had run him out because they weren't. <coughs> Excuse me for just a minute. And uh, those that were in Thessalonica... They were not true believers, and they did not search the scriptures, and they thought that everything that Paul had to say was basically hearsay and was against what the gospel was. So they went ahead, and they ran him out of Thessalonica, and when he went to Berea, he found a fertile ground. <coughs> Excuse me. And then it says in verse 15, and, that, and they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timothy for, to come to him with all speed, they departed. <clears throat> so they're taking the word back to both of Paul's companions and telling him, hey, Paul is saying that he needs you to come. So it's going to take them a little while to get this word because... Paul is in Athens, and Athens is kind of like a college campus here today. So when I start talking to you here about Paul and his mission in Athens, I want you to think of the college campuses where there, it's a seat of, uh, of learning, and, and not everything that's being taught is, is, is good or is, is useful, but 
You know, even in college, there are a lot of things that are being taught that, depending on who you are, may not necessarily be really good for you or be really useful. So as we read through this, I want you to think about those things. And it says in verse 16, now when, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Now he's, he's talking to everybody and anybody that he can he can talk to here in, in Athens because they're open to believing just about anything. And it says in verse number 18, then certain philosophers of Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler say? Others, some he seemed to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. So here Paul is, he's given them the straight message. And they've had so many different people teaching or preaching and, and giving different anecdotes and things about how to live their life and who to pray to and different things that they are very, very skeptical, skeptical of anybody that comes in and preaches or teaches or gives any other kind of doctrine because they're listening to everything and they're trying to hear something new, each and every one of them, but they don't really know what to believe. So they're believing in idolatry. They're, you know, each one can she pick and choose what they want to believe and how they want to say it. And here Paul is, he's getting to, to do the, the Mars Hill speech, is what it's called in my Bible. And he's getting ready to preach to them, and he's getting ready to teach them what the Word of God actually has to say. And he identifies them that, hey, you, you believe in all gods, and you have monuments to all gods. You even have a monument to mine, the unknown God. So here in verse number 19, it says, and they took him and brought him unto Aripagus, saying, may we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is, for thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something new. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. So here he is. He's given out an, uh, an accusation going, Hey, you believe in just about anything and you believe in all superstitions and, and, and all sorts of weird and strange things. But I'm going to tell you what the truth is. And it says in verse 23, For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship him, declare I unto you. So God is unknown to you because you haven't had a preacher. You're praying to him along with everyone else that you're praying to. But I'm going to tell you who the who God really is. And in verse 24, it's God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Now here in verse number 26, I want you to take a look because this is kind of important and a lot of people, including myself, have had a, the opportunity to read it and just kind of go over it and glance over it. But it says, and hath made of one blood all nations of men. And at this time, 
think of the Athenians, all right? You're in, in Greece, in Athens, and you have the Athens, you have the Romans, you have the Jews, you, and everyone is kind of separating themselves out. I mean, here Paul is using the word of God to go, listen, you're all of one blood. We are all related. We are all one people. Blood is blood. And if you're human, you are of a descendant. And of that descendant, Life is in the blood, yes, brother. But not only is life in the blood, but all, bl all human blood is interconnected. Amen. So here he is, he's trying to make the point that there is no difference between anybody. Amen. And it says at the end of verse 26, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. So the Lord has created all the, ha the bounds of habitation for man. And in verse 27, that they should seek the Lord if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he, not, though he be not far from every one of us. Have you ever felt like you were alone in a crowded room? I throw that out there because the way this is reading is that the Lord is always there and always present with us, but sometimes, you know, if you don't know him, you don't feel his presence. You don't understand that he is there and he is available to you, and you're alone. You're alone until you accept Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Then you're never alone. Even if you have no friends, you have no family, and you have no one else to talk to, you have Christ and God above to talk with and to talk to. Once you're saved, you're never alone. Amen. And in verse 28, it says, For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of our own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. So we are sons and daughters of Christ. We are sons and daughters of the Most High God. We were made in God's image. And because we were made in God's image, here Paul can say, for we are also his offspring. And it says in verse 29, for as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that, that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art in man's devices. So here he is, he's, he's talking about idols and about the works of hands and how man should not bow down and worship anything that was created by man's hands. If you can work it with your hand, God worked it well before you ever had anything to do with it. So here Paul is trying to get across to them and let them understand that they are very superstitious and, they, and in their superstition they have created things of their own hands in order to worship and in order to focus their thoughts and their prayers on instead of their thoughts and their prayers being focused on the one true God. Verse 30, in the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. So here he is, he's talking about Christ Jesus, and in verse number 30, it says, in the times of this ignorance, God winked at. Well, in God's timeline, that, the time frame that, 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 that took place in a man's life is nothing but a wink in God's eye. Because God is the one who created time, he created space, he created all of this. And it really is just a point in time for the Lord. 
It's a long time for us, but it's a point in time for the Lord. And that the Lord allowed a lot of things to take place beforehand, before the coming of Christ. And that's basically what he's talking about here, about a wink. Is that from the time of man's creation until Christ came on the scene, that's basically a wink in time for the Lord. And now, you know, it's about 54 years here after uh, the death of Christ, because it's about A.D. 50 to A.D. 57 when, when Paul is out here doing these things, according to the research that I did. Don't hold me to those dates, but it should be fairly close. And I'll tell you the reason why I say that here in a little bit, because of who's in charge in Rome. And in verse 32, it says, And when they had heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So right there, he's turned some people away with the resurrection of Christ. Going, no, this don't, don't believe it, I don't want to think about it. And then others who are a little more open to the word of God, to the word that Paul is preaching, going, okay, well, let's hear a little bit more on this because I don't know what to believe. And part of that, I think, is all because of their, their academic standing. Every one of them wanting to hear something new. Every one of them wanting to hear something different. You know, the Lord talks about having itching ears. Well, you know, you stick your finger in there, you scratch it a little bit. Sometimes that, uh, that helps, but it doesn't always take care of the itch that's there. And sometimes you have to put action to words in order for it to stick. And Paul here, through his faith and through his preaching, is trying to put actions to his own words and hopefully reach some of these people here in Athens because they've heard so much they're very skeptical very cynical if you will of anything that's being taught or being put out because they, there's a lot of different things that contradict one thing and another in the in the town of Athens it also happens at the universities you go to one class and you're taught this you go to another class and you're taught that we have the Oh, the academic review of creation versus evolution. And that's, they're not even teaching really creation in the colleges unless you're going to a the, uh, theological college or taking up a theological class. They're all teaching creation. Well, creation is not biblical. Not in the sense that we have, that, that it's being taught and what we have versus what the Bible says. So imagine things on that scale. The evolution. Creation is, yes. If, if I misspoke, uh, you know, for, forgive me, brother. I was talking about creation and evolution, and I, hopefully I didn't get the two, uh, two terms mixed. The Bible does not speak of evolution. But the Bible is very clear about creation. And in the academic world, those two are, are different and apart, and they aren't taught the same. In verse uh, number 30, 32, it says, And then they heard of these things. Oh, at verse 33. So Paul departed from among them. Howbeit certain men clave unto him, and believed among the which was Dionysus, Areopagate, and a woman named Demarius, and others with them. So the word of the Lord actually stuck with some of these people. And as Paul left, some of them went with him. And in chapter number 18, it says, And after these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth, and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come 
from Italy with his wife Priscilla because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. Now, the time frame that I was talking about earlier, about A.D. 50 to A.D. 54, is because when I looked up when Claudius was emperor in Rome was right around A.D. 50 through A.D. 54, 56, somewhere in that general time frame. He was the emperor that came in after Caligula. So it gives you a very good time frame of where Paul was at and when and why. And sometimes those dates and time frames are very important for us to understand, to understand what the Bible is saying and where it's at in time. And it says in verse number three, and because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. So Paul was basically a canvas seam seamstress. He put together tents. And he spent the time there with these individuals. And as he was making tents on the days that he wasn't working with them, he was out preaching and teaching and doing the things in the synagogue and in the local market and every place else. And it says in verse 4, And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. So here he is. He's kind of preaching. He's kind of teaching. Paul and or, or Timotheus and Silas finally catch up to him. They didn't catch up to him in Athens, but they catch up to him here because of the great distance they had to go and because of the timeline it took for that message to reach them. And now he starts to tell people about Christ. And we'll see that the Jews here, they're not real receptive. And in verse number six, it says, And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. The big reason why Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles, right there. If you ever have a question or you ever wonder why Paul is considered the apostle of the Gentiles, this verse should be a verse that clears that up for you completely. And in verse number seven, it says, and he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshiped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. Joined hard to the synagogue means they shared a wall. So in Justice's house, at the, probably at the back of the house, the back wall of the house is up against the synagogue. So here, Paul, he has separated himself basically from the Jews, but yet he's right next to the synagogue. I always thought that was kind of, kind of humorous there. Hey, I'm going to wipe my hands of you, but hey, I'm in a building right next to you. So the Lord, word of the Lord is still going out and still being heard, and the Jews are still able to hear it. My understanding, yes, you're, you're correct, brother. For those of you that may not have heard, he was saying that the Sadducees, uh, the sect of the Jews, did not really believe in the resurrection. There, my understanding is there are two sects in the Jews. There's the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the Pharisees are the ones that believe in the resurrection. The Sadducees are the ones that did not believe in the resurrection. And that was the contention between the two sects in the, in the Jewish religion. I can't speak on it any more than that. That's all that I really know about it because that's all that I was able to glean from the Bible and what I've read so far. Okay. 
And in verse number 8, it says, In Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. So here, just two verses up, you know, he was blasphemed, shook his raiment, and, and said, hey, you're your blood be upon you, and two verses down, now Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Because he is the ruler of his house, all of those that are in his house get to hear and get to follow along. And because he made a decision it affected the rest of the people in his house. It doesn't say how many, but it also it affected those that were in the synagogue because there were those that, were, that, that knew him because he was a chief ruler of that synagogue, that he accepted Christ and he accepted what Paul had to say and was saved. And he was a Jew too. Right? And he was a Jew as well, yes. It said in verse number 9, Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. So here he is. He's been told by the Lord, because, you know, I don't know about you, but there have been times when I got ready to go talk to somebody, and I felt like the Lord had just shut me down. It was like, nope, this person is not ready to hear the word from you. Do not open your mouth. Do not say anything. And here is the exact opposite. The Lord saying, hey, I've got many people here that need to hear it, and I know that they're going to respond. Paul, do not hold your tongue, for I am with you, and nothing will happen to you. You do not have to worry about being persecuted. You don't have to worry about being stoned. You don't have to worry about being run out of town. Because I have many people here that need to hear this, and I am making a way for you. In verse number 11, it says, And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Now, I don't believe that Paul could be there for a year and six months if the Lord wasn't there making sure that things were going to take place for his word to go out and for Paul to have a safe place to preach. In verse number 12, it says, And when Galileo was the deputy of Achaia, the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, Galileo said unto the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O you Jews, Reason would that I should bear with you. But if it be a question of words and names and of your law, look ye to it, for I will be no judge of such matters. So here Paul was getting ready to start to speak, and the Lord shut it down for him. Basically said, but Paul, you don't have to. The individual that's in charge is going to speak, and he's going to go ahead, and he's not going to allow this to happen. And in verse 16, it says, and he drave them from the judgment seat. He took the Jews and he pushed them out of the judgment seat. The judgment seat is basically like a court of law. So you bring your petition before the court. The judge sits up there, hears the case, and then makes a ruling. In this case... He wouldn't even hear, hear it, going, nope, this does not belong in this place, and he drove them out. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat, and Galileo cared for none of those things. And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren, and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla, 
and Aquila, having shorn his head in Censorea, for he had a vow. I'm not sure the significance of shaving one's head, but I've seen it over and over again in the Bible that when someone makes a vow or has something of significance take place, that they basically remove all their hair in order as a symbol that they have something going on in their life that they, have, that they are pursuing. And here Paul has taken all the hair off the top of his head. Doesn't say what the vow is. It doesn't say what he is going to go do. It just says that he has a vow. And it says, and he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they desired him to tarry longer time with them, he consented not. He says, nope, I can't stay any longer. I've got to go. And he bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem, but I will return again unto you if God will. And he sailed from Ephesus. So here he is, he's starting to do a lot of travel again. But he spent more than a year and six months in Corinth. And when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. So now he's back in the area where he had first started the uh, his mission, his first mission to this part of the world. He's come back through a second time. And he's visiting the places that he's already preached at. He's talking to the people that he has already talked to. He's being an encouragement. He's checking on their progress. He's checking on, you know, are they still locked in the faith and in the teachings and in all of the doctrine of Christ? He's making sure that they are still there, that they haven't fallen away, that they haven't fallen to some false doctrine, and he's there to, to help encourage and keep them up. And it says in verse 23, and after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia and Phyga in order strengthening all the disciples. So here he is, he's being an encouragement. He's doing those things that the Lord has asked him to do and he is continuing and he's going back around and he is seeing groups again and again and again as a good pastor to his flock. And he's got quite a large area that he's got to cover because he's talked with so many and preached the word to so many and had so many respond to the word of God. Verse 24, it says, And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, and an eloquent man, and mighty in scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. So here he is. He doesn't know the full scripture, the full thing of Christ of his death, his burial, and his resurrection. But he knows the scripture, and he is preaching it up to that point of John and being in the wilderness and the baptism and making way straight the path for one to come after. So he is being used of God to prep hearts and everything else. And it says here that he was being used, and he is going to learn the full gospel here shortly. And in verse 26, it says, And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla, who Paul had left, had heard, they took him unto them and expounded upon him the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much, which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. 
What better a claim can any man have than that? And he did not hear the word from Paul. He heard it from those that Paul had preached to. So the word of God went out from Paul, and now we find a disciple that has come from Paul's works, not from Paul doing it, but from those that Paul left. And it says that he was, oh, let's, what is the, the, the word here? Uh, well-spoken, means educated, was able to, to speak very clearly on matters and knowledge because he was very articulate. He knew how to say words. He knew what they meant. He knew how to describe those words. He knew the meaning thereof and was able to convey that to someone else. Have you ever been talking to somebody and you got so wrapped up into things and you used a word and they were not able to understand what it was that you were speaking about and you got stuck on that word and it was like, okay, how do I describe this to you so that way it comes across in a way, in a manner that you can understand? I've had an opportunity where that caused me a little bit of an issue until the Lord gave me the right word to use. Here this man is. The Lord is using him mightily, and the Lord is giving him the words, knowing that he's going to get saved, knowing that he's a believer, and knowing that he's, being, he's been in training. There is nothing greater that you can do in your whole life than give the word of God to somebody who doesn't have it. In chapter 19, it says, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said unto John's baptism. Now, John's baptism is the baptism of water, right? Repent ye and be baptized. So here it is. And then, so then Paul said unto, said, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues, and they prophesied. Paul laid his hands on them. They understood what the word of God was. They understood that Christ came, that he died for them, that he rose again, and that he lives and that only through him comes salvation. And when they had understood and accepted that, the Holy Spirit came upon them through Paul. This portion of scripture here is related to the thief on the cross. You know, people use these to talk about his baptism necessary for salvation. Well, in this case here, it seems like, yes, it is. For those of you that might not have been able to hear our brother here, he's talking about baptism and whether or not it's a necessary event for salvation. And he talks about the, the thief on the cross because when, he, when Christ said, you know, today you'll be with me, there was no baptism for the thief that was on that cross. Is baptism necessary? Well, when you read this, you may be able to infer that it is necessary to be, sal uh, to be saved, but I personally do not believe that that's what the scripture says. 
I believe that baptism is the first act of obedience once you're saved. And if you have the opportunity to be baptized, that you should be baptized. But it is not necessary for the Lord to work in your heart and for them to, to, in order for salvation. And I go back to the first, to, to Peter, when he first uh, preached to the Gentiles, to Cornelius, I believe is the name. And if I have the, the Roman soldier wrong, then you know, in his family, please forgive me. But it's, it was Peter and his first thing. The Holy Spirit came upon them. And they were not baptized when that took place. It doesn't say that, if I remember the scripture correctly, that they were baptized and then the Holy Spirit came. It says, as he preached, the Holy Spirit came and was upon them when they believed. So to me, that is justification in the scriptures that baptism is not necessarily necessary as well as the thief on the cross for salvation. Now, I'll have to go back and review that, but please, if you think about that, please take a look and see if I'm correct, because I don't want to tell you something that's not. <laughs> well, I think we will we'll stop there for today, and we will continue uh, in, in Acts next week, and remember that at the end of the month is Easter. So if you would, bow your heads with me, and we'll finish with a word of prayer, and then we will uh, open things up so that way everybody can get ready for the service to follow. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for your grace. Lord, I ask that you would just search me and help me, and Lord, give me the right words to speak and make sure that I haven't said anything here that's not right and not according to your word. Lord, we ask that you would just keep us that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you would lay your hand upon us, that we would know that the Holy Spirit is here and with us. And Lord, we just thank you for all that you have provided to us, that you have given to us, and that you keep on providing, even though we are undeserving. Lord, be with the message that follows. Be with each and every one of us that's here today. And Lord, allow this word to reach out and to touch those in any special way, Lord, that you have. In your name we pray, amen.